Hi, my name is Emmy Peck. Welcome to the show. We are in the Detroit Institute of Art's newly reinstalled ancient Middle East gallery. On display are 177 works spanning more than 8,500 years from 8,000 BC to 650 AD. These irreplaceable artifacts are from the ancient empires of Assyria, Babylonia, Persia, the Roman Empire, and the Arabian Kingdom. These are the areas of present-day Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Turkey, and Yemen. Designing an exhibit is somewhat like writing the text for a documentary. One does extensive research of the subject matter, describes each item thoroughly, then assembles all the pieces of information in a narrative that is not only accurate, but interesting to the public one wants to reach. It should not only impart new information to be studied, but bring the subject alive to pique and satisfy the curiosity of the target of the presentation. This was the aim of this newly reorganized and enlarged gallery. The reinstallation is the work of several specialists in this field, led by Dr. Jeff Emberling, consulting DIA curator and assistant research scientist at the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, DIA's ancient Middle Eastern language specialist, Lina Mirshad, Swarupa Anila, director of the DIA's interpretive engagement, and Dr. Birgitta Augustin, associate curator of Asian art and head of the DIA's Department of Arts of Asia and the Islamic world. Our guide through the highlights of the gallery is Dr. Jeff Emberling. My name is Jeff Emberling. I'm an archaeologist and museum curator based at the University of Michigan, and I've been the consulting curator for this reinstallation of the Detroit Institute of Art's Ancient Middle Eastern Gallery. We're standing in a gallery that's devoted to the cultures of the ancient Middle East, which is a, an area in a period that saw the development of the first farming in the world, the development of the first cities in the world, and some of the world's earliest large conquest empires. It's a sequence that includes, of course, the Hebrew Bible, the, the events that are depicted in the Hebrew Bible, as well as its uh, ultimate composition. So this is a, a formative region, a formative set of periods for the history of civilization, of world civilization, really. So this is a large region. It's a large history. It's complicated. There are a lot of different regional traditions. Of course, at the center of the ancient Middle East is Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in what is today Iraq, eastern Syria, southeastern Turkey, and southwestern Iran. And this is the region in which we see the world's first cities. Um, but there are many other cultures that are encompassed in this gallery, including a very different, although connected, set of traditions in Iran, connected but separate traditions in Anatolia, that is modern Turkey, and also cultures from along the eastern Mediterranean coast that we sometimes call the Levant, the lands of the Bible, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and western Syria. Finally, the exhibit includes cultures of South Arabia that were connected through the incense trade route to this region that I've just described during the time of the Roman Empire, which also, of course, leaves its footprint in this land. So th there's a real challenge in displaying the history and culture and art of the ancient Middle East because it's so complicated with all these different cultural traditions. And really, we're talking about 10,000 years of, of history. 
So we've had to make some decisions in this gallery about how we were going to present it. And one of the things that shapes the way that the gallery is presented and what is possible to present effectively is, of course, the collection itself. The DIA has, I'd say, a top five collection in the United States of material from the ancient Middle East. But because of the vastness of the subject, the collection has gaps in it. And so as we began the process of thinking about how we were going to display the material, we, we found that these gaps were, were quite large and actually fairly distracting from the point of view of what we could expect visitors to understand from looking at the objects themselves. And the, the DIA is, is now a national and even an international leader in what's called visitor-centered exhibit development. And this means that it's, it's no longer the prerogative of the curator himself or herself to make decisions about how galleries are structured, how exhibits are structured, how the panels are written. It's a group process. And, and this, this uh, for me, this represents a significant improvement in the way that exhibits are developed. So I was very personally very excited to be a part of this process. In any case, our discussions in the exhibit group over the last two and a half years, in fact, ended up centering on the idea of technology. And this turned out to be a kind of a resonant idea, not just technology for the sake of technology, but thinking about the way that technology led to the artistic possibilities that are presented in the stages of the development of each technology. Also thinking about art itself as a technology, because of course in the ancient world in general, in the ancient Middle East in particular, there was not really a conception of art in the way that we think about it today. The works that are on display in these galleries are, are not critical social commentaries uh, produced by independent artists who may have had a, a, an agenda of commenting, for example, on a political system, a particular person, a social situation. None of that was going on in the ancient world. These are works that were created on commission. We never know the name of the artist. In fact, they're produced on commission. Some of them, although we treat them as art today, were, were utilitarian objects that help us tell the story of these ancient cultures. So it, it does indeed make sense to think about art, not as art in the modern sense, but art as a kind of a technology that achieves certain functions of, of utilitarian functions like carrying water for, for uh, a dinner or something like that, but also social functions like displaying a person's status, displaying the power of a king. So as we started to think about this idea of art and technology and the ways that they were interconnected and the ways that art itself was a technology, we also recognized that uh, there was a moment in the, the trajectory of ancient Middle Eastern cultures where art began to play a, a much larger role, and that was in the development of the first empires in the region. Roughly after about 900 BC, when the Assyrian Empire conquered a vast swath of the Middle East, beginning in its base in northern Iraq, and ultimately extending all the way into Egypt, a distance well over a thousand miles. And it's in this context that art developed through these technological steps that we've traced in the gallery, was suddenly deployed on a dramatically new scale to dramatically new ideological purposes. That is the purposes of supporting the role of a emperor at the center of a large conquest empire. And the iconic piece that's right behind me, the Mushushu dragon from the Ishtar Gate at Babylon, is precisely a, an example of this kind of deployment of a set of technologies, actually. Technologies of ceramic making, technologies of glazing, which had been developed for use in relatively small vessels for the most part, was suddenly deployed on a massive monumental scale to depict the power of the emperors of Babylon in the 6th century BC. 
So in this gallery, we are presenting four different technologies because they are technologies that are important in the ancient Middle Eastern traditions. And we began with a technology of stone carving, which at first glance may not seem very technological at all. It, it began with something as simple as rubbing two rocks together. And in fact, what you see here in these two hand axes, very small, highly polished hand axes made of hard stone, are the two oldest objects on display in the entire Detroit Institute of Arts. They're about 10,000 years old. And they're, they're hand axes, but they're, they're probably more than just tools. They're probably sort of ceremonial or ancient valuables in a way, because many of the, the ones that we found don't show any signs of actual use. So to just provide a little bit of context for these objects, these are objects that are made in the first settled villages in the Middle East. So what we call the agricultural revolution, it's sometimes called the Neolithic revolution, is a process that happened over about 2,000 years in, in the ancient Middle East. A process of huge transformation of societies from hunter-gatherers to settled villages where people grew their own food, they had domesticated animals, and they invented certain kinds of techniques like the very first pots are made during this Neolithic period. So the, the earliest stone carving, as you can see, is quite simple. It's, these hand axes are not representational. And I want to move from the agricultural revolution, which was more or less complete by about 7,000 BC, to the next big leap forward in Middle Eastern societies, which is the urban revolution. That is the formation of the world's first cities. And this is a process that really began to take off around 4,000 BC. People who are not producing their own food for the first time in human history. And so this is a moment where other kinds of specializations happen. And this happens in technology. It's the time that the first copper is smelted. It's the time that the first mass production of pottery is, is made. These are bowls that undoubtedly reference the idea of the temple flock. So in these cities, we have also the first temples. So we have the first priests. We have the, the first sort of institutional priesthood. This is the period when we have the first kings. It's also the period when we have the first slaves. And so this was a, this was a big, big step in the development of the complexity of human societies and it really resulted in increased sophistication of artistic representations. So if, if we look at the little green stamp seal, number five there, this is a pre-urban representation, and it may take a little bit of uh, imagination for you to see a horned animal with four legs depicted in a very schematic way. This is a very soft stone, so it didn't require copper tools or drills. It could easily be uh, carved out with, uh, with stone. So that's a pre-urban representation. If we scroll down right below to number six, we see an incredible difference in sophistication at every level. The stone out of which this seal is carved is very hard. So we see a lot of developments in just this technology of stone carving over a period of several thousand years between the stamp seal with the goat and the cylinder seal with the, uh, the seated god. So seals are among the most distinctive products of ancient Middle Eastern art. And they, they begin in earlier periods with a form that's called a stamp seal. And here you see an example of a stamp seal that happens to be in the shape of a reclining bull made out of alabaster. And the underside of this bull is carved with schematic animal designs that you see on the, the clay there. So stamp seals were used from early times to mark property. So during the time of the first cities, around 3400 BC, a new form of seal was developed, and that's the cylinder seal. And here we see an example of it made out of extremely precious lapis lazuli. At that time, lapis lazuli came all the way from Afghanistan, so it was a very distant and very rare and very beautiful raw material. 
The case also, in keeping with our theme of stoneworking as a technology, shows that there's a very clear pattern through time of ability to carve designs in harder and harder stones as time progresses. So alabaster and lapis lazuli are both quite soft stones. And as we move through time, the time after about 2000 BC, we see an explosion of carving of stones like agate, chalcedony, and even quartz or rock crystal. After 2000 BC, Mesopotamian metal workers had figured out how to make hard bronze. And clearly that's what allowed the precise carving and the delicate shaping of the uh, cylinder seals that we see here made out of harder stones. I mentioned that writing was one of the inventions that took place in the context of the early cities in the world. The form of writing that was used throughout much of the ancient Middle East is called cuneiform, which means wedge-shaped, and it refers to the shape of the individual strokes that make up the signs. These are made by impressing a triangular reed into soft clay, and it produces a series of, well, wedges. So this writing system initially was invented to keep track of all of the workers in the early city. Just a very small text that is an account text that is listing the incomes and expenditures that are required to keep track of construction projects that could have involved thousands of workers. The script seems to have been developed for the language that we call Sumerian. So there's a, you have to keep in mind a distinction between the script, the writing system, and the language. So just as our alphabet can be used to write a whole bunch of different languages, cuneiform writing was used and modified and adapted to write a whole series of different languages. It seems most likely that it was invented for writing Sumerian, and very quickly it was adapted to write a very differently structured language called Akkadian. So in Sumerian, it made sense for the language to be largely what we call logographic, that is, individual signs could stand for entire words. But with the transition of the writing system to write Akkadian, while elements of that kind of sign for word continued, it became much more predominantly a syllabic writing system. Not an alphabet, but syllables. So you'd have different different signs would be for ba and b and bu. So anyway, it's a, <laughs> it's a very complex subject, obviously, but I wanted to give you some sense of what we were looking at here. So these are steps in the development of, of writing as a technology. Another step is illustrated here by tablet number 11. And what you're looking at there is a tablet and an envelope which we've broken open, or it was broken open when acquired by the museum. And you can see that there's writing on the tablet on the inside and writing on the tablet on the outside. What's that for? Well, it turns out that very often the same text was written on the interior tablet and on the outside envelope. As you can appreciate, these were written on soft clay that was not baked. So it would be pretty easy to come along after a tablet had been written and change some element of it. In this particular case, we're, we're looking at an agreement of a certain number of axes that was uh, held by one person. So it's a sort, of, sort of a contract. And so there could be a case, one could imagine a case, in which someone came along and, and changed the number of copper axes that was involved in this transaction. Well, if there was ever any question about that, you could break open the envelope and consult the original text, which by virtue of having been in the envelope could not have been tampered with. So this was really a solution to the problem of lying, cheating, and stealing that takes root in uh, these urban societies that were on a scale not seen before. We're seeing several kinds of developments, and I want to end this uh, particular discussion by looking at a very significant, unanticipated development of writing in Mesopotamia, and that is the use by kings of writing for their own propaganda to make them look better. So if we look down at the bottom of the case here at number 
6, 7, and 8. These are all what we call royal inscriptions. They're inscriptions written on behalf of kings with the names of the kings that describe their great deeds. So for example, number seven is a cone of a king named Gudea, king of Lagash, around 2100 BC or so. And this is part of a foundation deposit. So when kings were very often involved in building and rebuilding buildings, and they would make little foundation deposits and put inscriptions with their names on them in these, in these deposits. So who is reading that? How does that serve a propagandistic function? Well, the one audience for this was certainly the gods, because kings were especially interested in building, rebuilding temples. So by having their name associated with the building of the temple, the gods, of course, can read things even underground. They are putting themselves in the good graces of the gods, and this is an important part of the royal role in Mesopotamia. They're also doing this, though, for their successors, who they know, because all of these buildings are made of mud bricks, will come along at some later point and have to rebuild or, or uh, expand these buildings, and they will, in the course of their digging new foundation trenches, they'll find these foundations. And so this is a way of securing the king's place in history. So ceramics are one of the most commonly recovered objects of ancient Middle Eastern art. And they have a long tradition with many variants, some spouted vessels like we see here, some in animal forms, and of course some more strictly utilitarian pots. What we're looking at here in this pair are two painted vessels, but they're painted vessels that were made almost 4,000 years apart. On the left, the vessel with the cream-colored body and the red paint is a handmade vessel from Turkey, about 8,000 years old. And it's made in a technique that would be familiar to anybody who's ever made ceramics in, a, in an elementary school class. Made with coils that were then, uh, the, you make the snake, then you make the coil, then you smooth out the edges, and a few other steps of painting and so on, and then you have this, this pot. The little vessel on the right with the dark paint is a vessel that's made by mass production. And in this case, it's made by a technique of mass production that is known as the potter's wheel. So the potter's wheel was invented, as I mentioned, in the context of the, the first cities of the urban economies, and they allowed for the production of ceramics on a much larger scale than had been possible before. In the gallery, we're highlighting what we call ripple effects. And an example of this, a, a, a good example of this, is that during the fourth millennium BC, that is 4,000 to 3,000 BC, the time of the first cities, we've already highlighted a, a number of ways in which rotary technologies were being developed. So we have the development of the cylinder seal. This is an idea of rolling a cylinder across clay for purposes of marking and control. We have the potter's wheel. A wheel spins, allowing you to quickly make standardized pots. So it turns out that this is also the period in time when we have evidence for the very first wheels, as in wheeled carts. Another development was the development of glazing. So here you see a, an example of a brick that has a shiny glaze on the top of it. So it's painted and then fired to a very high temperature so that the material in the paint, which is formulated in a special way, turns essentially to glass. It vitrifies, it melts together. But it melts together in a way that it preserves the, the, the basic design. So that's a development actually that was made possible by metalworking, which required higher and higher and higher temperatures to be achieved in the firing process in kilns. And we're going to see how this was then deployed on an even larger scale by the time of the Babylonian Empire. Okay, so I've mentioned this in several different ways that metalworking has been an important technology in the ancient Middle East. The first copper artifacts that were cast were made, as I said, in the context of the first cities. And this means that you took a little piece of rock that had copper ore in it, you melted it to a, a high enough temperature that the copper would separate out from the impurities, and then you could pour that molten copper at a very high temperature 
into a mold and produce objects. So eventually, the Mesopotamian metal workers and metal workers elsewhere settled on a formula that involved mixing mostly copper with a little bit of tin. And that produces what we call tin bronze, or just bronze. That's the standard recipe for making bronze. And that produced the tools that were hard enough to carve hard stones and things like that. But they very quickly realized that they could make simple objects, but they could also, through a complicated process, make complex objects like this mace head here, which was made in around 2500 BC. So it's pretty old. It's pretty early in this process, but it's made by a technique that is called the lost wax method. And so this involves an elaborate procedure of not just making a, a mold out of clay that you can pour into. You first make a model of what you want to make in wax. You then make a mold around the wax model. The wax is encased within the mold and you leave a hole to pour in the molten metal. You pour the molten metal in, the wax melts out the bottom, and you're left with an object like this, very complex, but in order to extract it from the mold, you normally would have to break the mold. So this is a one-time use of this procedure in order to produce a complicated object like that. So there's a lot of sophisticated techniques that go in, into this. I wanted to move from the uh, copper and bronze working tradition to iron working. Now, this represents a very significant step. In fact, it's so significant that the standard archaeological terminology is that we have a bronze age and then we have an iron age. It's normally assumed that iron weapons must have been superior to bronze weapons, but in fact, that's not, that's not the way it worked. The earliest iron implements were, were made on a large scale in the Assyrian Empire, beginning in around 900 BC or a little after. And technological studies of those early iron uh, weapons, tools, and armor have shown that they were actually softer and less able to hold an edge than the bronze tools, weapons, and armor that they were replacing. That's a kind of a conundrum. So why would anybody have gone to the trouble of introducing iron? It required melting temperature of nearly a thousand degrees hotter. So very significantly more difficult to, to make. Well, it turns out that the problem was not so much solving a technological issue as it was solving a supply issue. So copper is plentiful in the Middle East, but tin, the other ingredient of bronze, is very rare. And so as the Assyrian Empire began to expand across the Middle East and it had need for weapons and armor on a much larger scale than had been necessary before, the limitation of a, of a distant and meager and expensive tin supply became a real logistical problem for them. Iron ore is plentifully available across the Middle East, particularly in the Zagros and Taurus mountains of Iran and Turkey. And so this was a logistical problem that was solved. So the iron weapons were, were adopted in order to allow for this larger and expansive army. And the first of the large empires that were based in the Middle East proper was Assyria. So beginning after 900 BC or so, the Assyrians successively conquered throughout what's now Syria, Lebanon, Israel, a little bit of Jordan, and down into Egypt itself. Now, as new people were incorporated into the empire, these, these emperors and their uh, political elites faced a new kind of problem. How do we convince all of these people that it's reasonable for them to be a part of these empires? We can't just do it by force because that would be unmanageable. Everyone would be in revolt all the time. There had to be some ideological propaganda message that could be conveyed and reconveyed and reconveyed. And art was a very significant part of the underpinning that allowed these empires to take root and to, to survive. So we're looking at one of the really important pieces in the DIA's collection. 
This is a relief of an Assyrian king, who you see here second from the left, uh, wearing a tall crown, holding a bow in a way that suggests he's just been successful in a military campaign. The figure behind him is a eunuch that is a castrated man. These are recognized on Assyrian release because they are beardless. And they very often have folds of fat uh, represented on their necks. And they were widely used in the Assyrian court and in the Assyrian military, in fact, because of the perception that they wouldn't have conflicted loyalty where the empire was concerned. Right before the king, kneeling down before him, is a soldier, almost certainly an Assyrian vassal soldier. And we think this because he's allowed to have his sword in the presence of the king. This is not, this is not the posture of a defeated enemy. This is a, a soldier who is being honored for his service. We also see a bearded Assyrian official, general, or most likely the crown prince. He looks apart from the crown and regalia every, every bit like the king himself, and so it would be easy to see him making that step into the role of king. So this relief, among other things, enshrines the idea the emperor, the, the king himself, is someone to whom it's natural to bow down, to prostrate yourself, and to offer to kiss his feet. That's an idea that is enshrined in this relief that doesn't require sort of deliberate pronouncement. It's just there. And anyone who would have seen this would have had that message proposed to them. So this is part of a set of carved stone reliefs that would have lined the wall of the palace of this Assyrian king. This particular king's name is Tukul Apil Eshara, also known as Tiglath Pileser III. And so this particular relief preserves just one third of the height of the original relief. There are traces of a cuneiform inscription just above the king's head in a, in a band that runs all the way across the relief. So there would have been a thick band of cuneiform and then above it another set of scenes making this a truly monumental presentation of Assyrian power. This technique of decoration is an innovation of the Assyrian Empire and while it, it doesn't by itself show an innovation in stone carving, it does show the ability to first of all conceive of an ideological program on a monumental scale unthought of before for the display of this power. And it also proposes the command of a huge labor force to obtain this stone, to drag it over the landscape, to get it into the palace, to carve it in accordance with a single design. So although we're just looking at a, a mute slab of stone now, there is a, a huge amount of work that went on behind it. The story that we're telling in this gallery is a pretty disciplined focus on art and technology. But objects themselves are unruly. They speak in many voices. They tell many stories. And so I can't resist just a little bit of a side story here. If you look at this brick on the side, this brick is a brick from one of the most distinctive Mesopotamian architectural forms, which is a ziggurat, a temple tower made of stages with the idea that it would have a shrine on top normally so that the, the priests and also the king himself could get closer to the gods. And here we have not just a, a brick, but it's a brick with a cuneiform inscription naming the king Shulmanu Asharad III or Shalmaneser III, as he's also known. And so this represents a little bit of a detour from our focus on art and technology, but it's an interesting one and it's an important one from the point of view of this very important and distinctive Mesopotamian architectural form. We're looking here at a winged guardian figure that's from a different Assyrian palace at the site of Nimrud in what's now northern Iraq near the city of Mosul. 
This is a, from an earlier Assyrian king, Ashur Nasser Pal II. It's a very distinctive Assyrian motif. It shows this winged figure with a, a cone-like object in one hand and a bucket in the other hand. You can just see the remains of a tree, floral elements there on the right-hand side. And he is either purifying or fertilizing this tree, which we know from other representations represents the king himself. Again, illustrating the way that these kings were seen as connected to the fertility of the land and that the kings themselves ensured fertility through the assistance and the good relationships that they maintained with the, with the gods. So this relief is particularly resonant because it comes from a palace that was during this year in 2015 blown up by ISIS militants. So the palace itself was excavated in the 19th century, in fact continued to be excavated in the 20th century with major discoveries including the underground burials, intact underground burials of Assyrian queens complete with gold jewelry. Many of the reliefs were taken from the site and brought to the British Museum especially, but other museums uh, like the Metropolitan Museum in New York have major collections of them. But many of the reliefs were left in place in the palace walls. And so videos of ISIS show barrel bombs lined up around the walls of the palace and then a huge explosion. And although we archaeologists are not able to go there on the ground to inspect the damage ourselves, satellite photos show that indeed the surviving walls of this palace have just been leveled. So this, I think, gives us an appreciation of the value of having these collections outside Iraq in places like Detroit and makes us appreciate what remains to us from the past all the more than we would otherwise. So we have here uh, a further deployment of a technology that is uh, ceramic glazing. And here uh, used to make a composition, this whole series of molded bricks that together depict a serpent dragon that was known in the Babylonian text as a mushushu, which means furious serpent. And it's clearly a composite creature with the back legs of an eagle, the front legs of a lion, the body of a serpent, the little stinger on the tail is a stinger of a scorpion. And this creature is the emblem of the city god of Babylon who was named Marduk, also sometimes called Baal. And this god, when Babylon came to take the place of Assyria as the imperial power across the Middle East, beginning in around 612 BC, Marduk was elevated to the head of the, the Mesopotamian pantheon. And so this dragon was a symbol of the highest order of Mesopotamian gods. So this is a polytheistic system. Many of the gods were gods who were symbolized by natural phenomena like the sun, like the wind, storm, rain, and so on. And so there was a sense that when you felt the sun shining on you, you were in the presence of the sun god. When you felt the wind, you were in the presence of the storm god, and so on. So that is to say that for Mesopotamians, God was not a distant or an abstract phenomena. The gods were all around and omnipresent. They also thought that demons were around all the time. And anything bad that could happen to a person, sickness, misfortune, was caused by demons. So you can see that for us, perhaps the supernatural, the, the divine, is a more abstract concept, for many of us anyway today, than it would have been for the Mesopotamians, for whom gods and demons were around, they were present both as potential benefactors and as potential threats. Images of gods were extremely potent, and normally in a, a Mesopotamian temple there would be a statue of a god, but this was considered such a powerful image that regular people weren't allowed into the presence of the god themselves. Only priests who were ritually purified or kings could enter into the presence of the god. So the fact that we would have this very public 
and very large-scale presentation of symbols of gods, like Marduk, for example, and uh, Ishtar is another one who was symbolized on this Ishtar gate, is a, is a dramatic presentation, a dramatically public presentation, and a dramatically large-scale presentation of the presence and the favor of these gods within the Babylonian Empire. Babylon at this time, around 600 BC, was the largest city in the world. Probably 200,000 people or so lived there. It was legendary to the Greeks. Herodotus wrote about it, although he had never been there. But uh, legends of Babylon reached the Greek world. And we have some reflections of the glory of Babylon in those sources. The Babylonians took over the territory of the Assyrian Empire and they continued many of their practices, including deporting people who they had conquered for the purposes of breaking up resistance. And the most famous example of this from the Babylonian Empire is that they captured Jerusalem, which the Assyrians had never done, and they deported Jews, the elite, the temple elite, the scribes, back to Babylon in what's called the Babylonian captivity. And there are many, many echoes of this in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, because it seems that much of the Old Testament, as we understand it, was compiled in Babylon. A perfect illustration of the fact that much of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, was, was compiled in Babylon is the Tower of Babel story. This is a story about humanity having the hubris to want to build a tower so that they could reach the heavens. And the, the punishment for their hubris is that in the Bible is that humanity is forced to speak diverse languages so they can't understand each other and any projects like this are, are no longer possible. Well, that idea of building a tower to reach the gods, that's the Mesopotamian ziggurat. That was the Mesopotamian idea. And so really this is a story about the hubris of Babylonians thinking that in constructing a ziggurat, they were in fact reaching God. So the Persian Empire took over the territory that had been governed by the Babylonian Empire, expanded it significantly, and again, built an empire larger than any that had been known before. It was an empire characterized by vast wealth in, in all kinds of precious materials that came in from all the provinces of the empire. And one of the capital cities of the Persian Empire was at Persepolis, that's a Greek word that means city of the Persians. And the Persian Empire decorated this city in much the same way that the Assyrians had in, in purely technological terms, to go back to that story that we're telling in this gallery. That is, they had carved stone reliefs that lined the walls of the ceremonial audience hall, entranceways, and platforms in Persepolis. So, However, there's a very significant difference here, and it's a difference that's not so much in the, the material technology, but in the idea. And again, if we take the idea that art is a technology seriously, they've taken a technological development, the idea of large-scale stone carving that proposes an ideology of empire, and they've turned it to a very different ideological purpose, where the Assyrian reliefs depict the power of the emperor, the power of life and death, the incredible might of his armies, the danger of resisting. It's a very militaristic kind of message. The Persians had a very, very different idea, ideological idea for their empire, and their reliefs depict the peoples of the empire coming together for a feast. And it's probably a very specific feast, the New Year's Feast. It's now known as Nowruz in Iran. And you can see here, for example, on the left, uh, a servant carrying a tray that's covered that would have had some sort of food on it. And guards, there is a, a procession of spearmen standing guard. And on the right, a court official who is part of a procession moving to take part in these festivities. So similar material technology, but a very different artistic technology being deployed here in the Persian Empire.
So we've talked about the ways that art is deployed in empire, how it's uh, deployed for varied purposes. But empires do other kinds of things because they're fundamentally organizations of conquest that are incorporating or attempting to incorporate subject peoples into a single political unit. There are a lot of cultural dynamics that are expressed in works of art that are not imperial productions. They're not productions for the court. These are produced for regular people, for daily use, and yet they, they express some of the cultural changes, the maintenance of tradition, the introduction of new traditions, and the ways that those traditions mix, become hybridized in the context of, of new empires. So what we're looking at here is mostly material from a city called Seleukia in what's now Iraq. So this is a city that was founded after the conquest of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great in 333 BC began his conquests from Macedonia through Turkey into Syria, Egypt, and then back to Iraq and into Iran, ultimately conquering the Persian Empire and bringing with him in his wake in the years and decades after significant numbers of Macedonian and Greek settlers into the lands that he had conquered. Even though his empire lasted just a short amount of time, the territory was taken over by his generals and their descendants, and one of those named Seleucos. Seleucos founded Seleucia, a city in, in what's now Iraq, and this is a city that was inhabited by Greek settlers as well as local people. And those different cultural traditions are well illustrated by the objects in this case, many of which are here at the DIA on loan from the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology at the University of Michigan, which excavated at the site in the 1920s and 1930s. On the left, you see three objects that show a, a long-standing Mesopotamian tradition of the way that goddesses are represented. And this is figures that show them as frontal, nude, often with their hands on their breasts. There's no concern here about nudity. There's no idea of prudishness, no need to cover anything up. This is a, a very frank depiction of a goddess figure. And on the left we have of these th three, we have a figure from about 2000 BC. So that's a predecessor of this imperial tradition made of clay. And on the right, we have two bone figures, one of them quite recognizable and the other quite a bit more schematic, both of which are from this imperial city of Seleucia. And if we move to the right, you see other figurines that were produced in this imperial context. And you can see immediately that this is a very different idea about, well, first of all, the way that you represent female form the first thing you do is you put some clothes on it. And you can see that these are very sort of classical looking representations, or this kind of reclining scene is a typical banqueting sort of scene and so on. And the very rightmost uh, of these three heads, it's a woman's head with a tall hat on it. This is in the Greek style, but she's depicted as wearing an Iranian headdress. So not Mesopotamian tradition, not Greek tradition, an Iranian headdress, which further shows the kind of the mixing that goes on at the level of everyday people's lives in the context of these empires and the way that art facilitates, represents, and maintains those identities. So here we have a representation of the last of the empires that we cover in this gallery. That's the Roman Empire. And even though Rome controlled the Middle East for several centuries, it's not usually thought of as a part of the history of the ancient Middle East. And so this is actually a significant innovation, a significant addition to the way that histories of the Middle East are normally told. And particularly now with all the attention being paid to destructions of Palmyra by militants in Syria, which is a Roman site with its colonnaded street and so on. It's all the more important that we recognize that this is actually a, a extremely important moment in Middle Eastern history. And this also shows 
a different cultural tradition, a different artistic tradition. We see the use of, of mosaic made out of different colored stones. That's definitely not a native Middle Eastern technology. It's one that's brought in with, with the Romans. And we see a very Roman looking figure in the center there. And you can just make out some letters, perhaps, behind his head. And this is what makes this so interesting from the point of view of ideology and art as technology. Those letters say Tigris, as in the Tigris River. So this figure is not a human figure. It's a, it's a deified personification of the Tigris River. Now this mosaic is not part of an imperial display. It's actually part of a wealthy person's living room. And so what we have here is art being used not on an imperial scale, but it's still in service of, a, of an idea of empire. And it, on a daily basis, as people maybe come over for dinner and recline in this living room, they're reminded of the idea that Rome owns the territories of the Middle East. The Tigris belongs to Rome. That's the idea that's being promoted here in this beautiful mosaic. And so it's ideology operating not at the level of the court. In this later empire, ideology has been taken over by the people themselves, and that shows imperial ideology at its most successful. It's not something that has to be made and fashioned exclusively at the center. It's something that people themselves are taking up and expressing and maintaining in the context of their own homes and their own lives. One of the innovative parts of this gallery is an interactive touchscreen video that contextualizes these imperial works of art within the empires that made them in the particular times and places and in their architectural settings within the imperial capital cities. So we have the Assyrian Empire, we have in the gallery reliefs from the imperial capital of Nimrud, and here we have a representation of the palace of Nimrud, entering an interior room of the palace where winged genies fertilize sacred trees, and there we have the relief from the gallery itself. From the territory of the Assyrian Empire, we have the Babylonian Empire, which took over most of the same territory and expanded in some other directions. And flying into Babylon itself, you see the ziggurat in the background, and you see the brightly colored glazed brick compositions of the Ishtar Gate. And there we have the Mushushu dragon, symbol of the god Marduk. surrounded by representations of bulls, as well as representations of lions, the lion being the symbol of the goddess Ishtar. And from Babylon, we go to the Persian Empire, and you can see that they took over the Middle Eastern territories and expanded very significantly, especially to the east, and to the capital city of Persepolis with its palaces and audience halls built on a platform. And here we have a representation of uh, figures coming to a feast. And here we have the court official from the palace of Dariush. And from the Persian Empire, we briefly just evoke the empire of Alexander the Great, which lasts less than 10 years, and the Seleucid Empire, the Iranian Parthian Empire, and the Roman Empire that fought against the Parthian Empire, and at various points controlled much of the Middle East into 
perhaps even into Iran. And here we have the, one of the most important cities of Rome, of the Roman Empire in the Middle East, Antioch. And here we have the living room of a wealthy citizen of Antioch with its mosaic of the personification of the Tigris River. This takes us up to the fall of Rome. So that's an overview of what we, we've done here in the Gallery of Ancient Middle Eastern Art at the DIA. It's an engaging, and I hope you'll find interesting, way of looking at the art of the ancient Middle East. And I also have to say that even though I've talked about this now for quite a long time, there's a lot more in this gallery. There are a lot more objects that we weren't able to show. And there are a lot of other stories about particular histories and particular areas and local works of art that I am sure will be engaging and interesting to all of your viewers. And I invite you to come and experience them. The DIS collection of artifacts from the ancient Middle East are now finally displayed in this new gallery. These objects are even more precious now because they are at risk due to the political instability in most of the areas from which these antiquities originated. Museums hold in trust these items of emerging technologies and artistic achievements for all mankind. The DIA is open Tuesdays through Thursdays, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., Fridays, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., Saturdays and Sundays, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. For more information, call 313-833-7900 or visit www.dia.org. Admission to the museum is free for Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County residents. Come and visit one of America's great museums.